Then he said unto them, Who are you? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning, I have many things to say to you, and to judge you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. And they understood not that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, and he was referring to the time when they would put him on a stake and they would lift him up, and he was going to die. He said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. What's interesting, a thing about inheritance, or not inheritance, but uh, carrying on the genetics from your family. You never notice that the children seem to act the same way parents do in most cases? Sometimes we don't want them to. Many times we want them to and they won't through rebellion or whatever. You know how especially uh, teens get when they get at a certain age. Jesus is trying to tell them is that if you have the genetics, the seed, the spirit of God, you're going to act like your father. That's what he was trying to say. If you saw him, you saw the Father. When people look at us, and they put you on that forensic table, when someone walks in that door, do they see the child of God? Can they relate? Well, this person must have the Spirit of God because look how they behave. Look how they act. Look what they do. He goes on. In verse... Uh, uh, let's pick it up in 30. And as he spoke these words, many believed on him. These said to the Jews who believed on him, If you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, let's, let me jump down now to... Um, well, I'm just gonna pick, I'll go ahead and pick it up in 33. And they answered and said unto him, We are of Abraham's seed. Now, in all probability... If you would go into the DNA of that race at that time, in all probability, what they were saying was true. They could probably break it down, and the scientists could look at that DNA and say, he is of this lineage. And they could track it back because that doesn't change. They'll have the same specific characteristics in that. But Jesus says something different. He says, he says, we are of Abraham's seed, and we were never in bondage to any man. How do you say that we, you will make us free? Jesus answered and said unto them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, whoever commits sin is the servant of sin. When you commit sin, you have created something that did not exist a moment before. You have given life to something that from what all the Bible's intense purposes tells us is never die, dead. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I thought God says, we're going to be clean. He says, he removes all sin. Absolutely. Here's an interesting thing about, and I'm going to go into uh, Leviticus in a few minutes. The Bible says and gives us the indication that when you and I sin, we, are, we, we carry that sin in us. When we repent, he takes that sin that, and removes it. It doesn't say it's gone. It's destroyed. He removes it from us. There's other, there's other scriptures that say he covers our sins. It's, it's, it has a life and he takes it outside and, and he buries it somewhere. He removes, he forgets our sins. The Day of Atonement shows us that when this day is complete and all those sins that have been cre created from the very beginning, when those sins, when it's all finished, they're taken. It's like they still exist. And Jesus says they put, put them on Satan and brings him into the wilderness. Whether we realize it or not, that when you sin, you have created something that did not exist just the moment before. And from all understanding from Scripture, it never dies. The fruits of that sin carry on. Now, I want you to think about sin in, a, in, in this fashion. Try to understand this. When a person sins, the first time you do something, if you're consciously sinning, you have to fight to do it, don't you? 
Maybe you're struggling with something that you haven't overcome in a, while, in a long time. Or maybe you've never overcome it. It's a sin that's... That it's just too painful to even talk about to anybody. But you go to God with it and you can't. And you find yourself struggling and you give in. Knowing you shouldn't do that and you give in. You feel pretty bad about it. Well, once you've done that, it's easier to sin the next time. It has a blueprint. It has a pattern. It becomes familiar. Scientists know, when, they, when, they, when these, these forensic scientists, when they study crime, they watch a murderer and they're tracking down this murderer, they watch the patterns, they see the blueprints. They'll know that when it begins to change or begins to accelerate, that someone's going to die a lot sooner than they did between the last ones. It's because the mind is now altered. That one of peace that God gives, the direction of the clear conscience changes because sin begins to move in and begins to fill the voids in your mind and in your heart where God's spirit was before. A person who walks into a store just picks something off the shelf and steals it. The first time they can actually put they can put pulse monitors on them. The first time someone does it and see how it begins to alter the mind. It builds up the stress. The pulse picks up. The sweat begins to grow. But after they've done it for a while, it's no big deal. The consciousness has been been singed. They walk in. They just grab something, put it in their pocket, and they leave. Children are taught that from the youngest of ages today, that it doesn't make no difference. They would, they would, when they're little, they would hide when they talk about people. As they get older, they don't mind talking about people in front of people and sinning. Well, sin is like that. If you were in a closed room and a car motor was running, it produces what's called carbon monoxide. We all, we all understand what that is. Your body will absorb carbon monoxide you know it's bad for you. You know you can't breathe it. It'll kill you. And the reason is, is that, that the body receives the carbon monoxide 210 times in exchange when it breathes, 210 molecules for every one molecule of oxygen it takes in. Now, most people don't realize that. Now, sin is like that. Is that even though you know it's not good for you, for some reason, the human carnal mind and body goes after the things it shouldn't have that's not good for it. Knowingly, it will destroy that individual. But they'll do it anyway. We tease about that a lot when it comes to food. What do we want? Fatty, greasy, good tasting foods, lots of chocolate, give me the ice cream. Now we know that stuff's not good for us. And we go after it anyway. Well, sin's like that. A person who sends that conscience, the blueprint of that, of that sin, begins to take over the mind. It begins to alter. So Jesus Christ is looking at the Pharisees. And they're saying, no, we're of, we're of Abraham. And Jesus Christ says, you're not of that seed. Why? It's because the body was altered. The mind was altered. The genetics of the blueprint of sin had taken over. And the mind of God was placed aside. What Jesus at Christ at one time told them. He says, he says, you put aside the law of God for your own traditions. They were putting aside their own parents for their traditions. And just putting them aside. He goes on to say, in verse 35, And the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. See, once you sin, there's no way to get rid of that sin. Jesus Christ has to remove it. It's as if you're in that locked room with that automobile running and knowingly that if you breathe that air, you're going to die. Without Jesus Christ putting us at one with God, you're going to die. There's not one thing you can do about it. You can't do anything consciously. You can't do anything subconsciously. Until you give it to Jesus Christ and He, and He alone, removes that from you, you will die in your sins. Your spiritual DNA is altered and changed forever until He removes that molecule and takes that sin from you. And it's like a cancer when it's inside you. 
It begins to eat everything around it. It begins to change. Until, until at some time, people the closest to you say, man, what's happening to you? What's going on? You're not the same person anymore. And you watch their the, the personalities begin to change and begin to alter. Well, that's what sin is. And it begins to alter you to the point that you cannot do anything about it. Now, let's pick up the story here in this back and forth. Let's just go a little bit further. It says, uh, verse 38. Well, I'll read verse 37. It says, I know that you are Abraham's seed. Jesus says, look, I know physically you're his seed. You know, DNA would prove it. I mean, if they had the scientific uh, studies back then, like we have today, there'd be no doubt. And Jesus says, yeah, I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen of my father, and you do that which you have seen of your father. Now he's going into the creation. See, this is what I wanted to bring in about the DNA. Jesus Christ is saying, yeah, you're of Abraham, but your DNA says you're of Satan. Now that's hard for them to understand. But that's what he's trying to tell them. And that's what I'm saying here today. You and I, unless we go to Jesus Christ and give Him our sins and have Him remove them from us, we cannot be in the kingdom of God. We can't be at one with God until He does that. Now, verse 38. That which I speak, I have seen with my Father, and you have seen with your Father. Then answered and said unto them, Abraham is our father, and Jesus said unto them, If you were of Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We are not born of fornication. Now that was going back to attacking Jesus, that, that he was born out of wedlock, because supposedly Mary to say, Oh, Mary, had, she was pregnant before... He was married, so was trying to trying to again uh, disprove who he was. It says it says we have one one father, even God. And Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither I came of myself, but He hath sent me. Now, let's move on to look at Romans chapter seven. Romans chapter seven. What Jesus was trying to, to tell them is that you can be here every week. You can sit in an audience and you can listen to a tape and still not be of God if you're not careful. He was trying to tell the Pharisees that same thing. Yes, you are of Abraham. And he can go back and have all the lineage. But he's trying to say that unless you do the deeds of the one who sent you, you're not going to be his heir. You and I can go through the, through the stages of, of the baptism, repentance, the laying on of hands. If we don't change, we're not going to make it into the kingdom. Because the seed, the spirit of our Father, who gives that to us, will be taken from us. Because it will not dwell in the same housing as the seed of Satan. All right. Romans chapter 7, verse 15. This is, the, this is the section where Paul is struggling with the two natures. It says, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would do, I do not. But what I hate, that I do. I know that's true in my life. You may have the same problem sometimes in your life. Not all the time. But sometimes it's easy to go through and you don't struggle and, and it's, like, it's like it's very simple to follow a way of doing what God says to do. Then there's other times that Satan will bring on so much on you it's like you just hardly can barely move without seem, seeming like there's something going wrong. Gilbert and I were working the other day and, and it was a stressful day. We had a lot of work going on. We are trying to get finished and Sabbath's coming on. And the littlest things would happen. And then I finally busted out laughing. I said, you know, on any other day that wouldn't bother me. But all of a sudden, a person sitting at the red light and hasn't gone yet when the light turned and he's still sitting there, bothered me. <laughs> and you want to get on your horns like, ah, 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 come on, I got places to go. And just busted out laughing. I said, you know, it's funny how that is, huh? 